Every video I ever do starts with me sitting down and adjusting myself. Just, why can't coordinates stay where you've put them on? Hello Biscuits, it's Cupcake Kami Summer back here and welcome to another video. Today is one that I've had on my mind for a while now, ever since it was first suggested to me by Petty Cats. I'll be comparing issue 1 and issue 63, or first and last one, of the Gothic and the later Bible. What has changed? What remained the same? These two issues cover a period of 16 years between 2001 and 2017. So, has the Gothic and Lolita Bible remained Gothic and Lolita Bible? We'll find out. Here's a chance to use my Japanese language skills to some good and to some use because it's been a while. But before we delve into that, make sure that you click the subscribe button and the bell one next to it if you want to be notified every time I upload. All the videos that I do are somehow related to Lolita fashion, however vaguely, although not all of them are about the Gothic and Lolita Bible, there's plenty of other stuff, so make sure to subscribe to that if you want more Lolita fashion content. And if you want to get that content before other people do, then I suggest you join my Patreon, where the $2 a month tier gets you early access of one week to every single video that I upload, and if that's too much, there's a $1 a month tier that gets you early access to every single blog post that I put out. If I'm looking down, it's because I made notes. I'm prepared. I'm not going to do this video live as we go along because that would be a lot of flicking through and not very cohesive. These are the issues in question. I imagine a lot of you out there who would have been around in Lolita fashion in 2017 either already have a copy of this one or at least have seen it. This one, most people tend to know more from the Lolita Fashion Archives and from the scans that have been uploaded. Not to say that it's that rare, especially considering how this was a reprint. It's just that as time went on, it got harder to get hold of because people are holding on to these for good reason. First thing, before we even get to things that we can see or things that are contained within the magazines themselves, a key difference is that whilst by the time the last issue came out, Gothic and Lolita Bible was a standalone publication, issue one was not intended to be a standalone publication. This was a supplement, a one-off muck released by Kira to focus specifically on Gothic and Lolita fashion within all the other street fashions that they covered in Kira magazine, which was a lot broader. So because of this, some of the differences that I'll be touching on about the contents will be rooted in that context, but there's also plenty of other differences to discuss. So first glance, we can already see a distinct difference in that one is distinctly gothic and Lolita, and the other one is more Lolita than gothic. This is before we even open the thing, and as you flick through them, it becomes obvious that it's a running theme. Issue 1 had a distinctly darker aesthetic throughout, even though it includes release previews of what we'd consider sweet releases, obviously this being 2001, by now, this is all just old school to some people. But even at the time, looking at the releases there, there are those that were definitely intended to be gothic or more classic, and those that were intended to be sweeter. And even the sweeter ones are presented in a darker way. Either the photo shoots are designed in a way that, that has that frumpy Victorian feel to it, all the clothes are presented on darker backgrounds when it's just clothes laid out flat. Whereas this one is distinctly more sweet and focused on lighter aesthetic. 
even though this is from 2017 when arguably OTT Classic was still quite a big thing but we have started to see the return of very sweet things and I feel that issue 63 of Gothic and Lolita Bible reflects the fact that majority of people who are reaching for this magazine follow some kind of lighter aesthetic. By 2017, although this started a while back, I can't necessarily pinpoint when, but by 2017, for a while now, Gothic and Alita Bible had been putting Gothic releases on separate pages dedicated purely to Gothic. So we had releases that were strictly Lolita, whether they were Gothic in nature themselves or not didn't matter, but they were Lolita and Gothic. So brands such as H. Naoto and Marble and those ones that probably leaned more visual K and Japanese Gothic and things like this. And may have had a Lolita release, but it was more occasional rather than regular. They got their own pages and even they were not creating a separate photo shoot, were pictured on lighter backgrounds and the overall look of those pages is lighter. What was interesting to see when comparing the two was that in 2001 the focus was very much on the clothes. When you flick through the pages about releases, the focus was predominantly on the garment and on showcasing those where a coordinate was put for a conceptual photo shoot. Individual components of the outfit were named, but the model was not. The models were selected, I assume, from a pool of models already available to Kera and picked on the basis of which one felt the most appropriate for that particular brand and for that particular concept. Whereas in 2017, not only we have already established models in the later fashion, like Misako Aoki and Midori Fukazawa, and quite a few other ones, even when other models are used to showcase the brands, they tend to be named. So whether due to pressure to give models the recognition that they deserve as well as a bit of advertising because models can also be scouted from other publications or to avoid creating a dichotomy where you're either a Lolita model or you're a rando off the street they started naming the models and giving them credit for showcasing clothes that they modeled even still majority of the models featured in Gothic and Alita Bible by 2017 were the popular and the established ones. The magazine wasn't there to give someone their big break. And oftentimes when the model isn't one of the Lolita ones, it's someone within the entertainment industry, either a musician, Mana being obvious example, or idol groups, not necessarily the big well-known ones and i say that i know that there is a world of idol groups but beyond akb48 and nmb48 <laughs> i have no idea what they are so they may be well known i genuinely have no idea but if the models aren't early to models they're more likely idols or musicians or someone already within the entertainment industry in Japan, which is an interesting thing to note. And it kind of leads me to the next point in that in Gothic and Alita Bible issue one, the focus was exclusively on Lolita fashion and things and people related to it. As such, the people featured in here have some sort of direct relation to the fashion. Again, Mana is the obvious example, having been a musician who has established a Lolita brand. But we also see that where illustrations are used, they're almost exclusively by Mihara Mitsukazu, the person who has created the cover and many other iconic covers of Gothic and Anita Bible issues. There is a series of more conceptual photo shoots in here featuring brands collaborating with musicians. Again, because that's not a scene that I'm familiar with, I can only assume that these are musicians that would have been wearing those brands or something like it anyway. And overall, issue one has a feel of wanting to collaborate with 
artists, with people who you may see in Gothic and Lolita clothing at that time. Whereas issue 63 ends up feeling almost as if their focus is on collaborating with brands or with businesses slash celebrities. As I said, we see idols and idol groups used as models. And by 2017, using idol groups as models isn't exclusive to Lolita fashion. If you flick through other magazines like Llama or Tool, you'll see that it's the same. It's it's almost as if if you're already an idol, you're an easy model to find and your manager probably makes more effort to try and get you those jobs to promote you. But also we see in issue 63 more previews of more brands that are available for sale and we get additional content that relates to things such as you know cafes cafes are quite keen on promoting themselves as you know this is a worthy place for lolitas to visit so they would have collaborated with a magazine like gothic and lolita bible either to provide backdrop for a photo shoot or just to have something written about them to, to promote their business. Furthermore, in issue one, all the brands that have had their clothing featured and previewed in here listed their branch addresses on the pages where the previews were shown. By issue 63, Gothic and Alita Bible has a dedicated shop list towards the end of the magazine, featuring every business that was featured and every branch of that business that was featured. So for example, if you were looking for Angelic Pretty, you wouldn't just get the address of the La Forêt or the Marui One branches in Tokyo, you'd get Angelic Pretty branches throughout Japan so that wherever you were in Japan, you're able to visit. And in a way, this expansion of showcasing more brands is a reflection of what happened in the later fashion. In 2001, there were genuinely just a handful of labels that were exclusively Lolita, plus a couple that showcased more gothic clothing and Lolita adjacent clothing. This is the beginnings of Lolita fashion growing into what it is now and having that boom. I don't really want to say boom, but I guess that's the best way. And especially if Kenna were intending to have this as a one-off, as this is a supplement that you can flick through, get your information and that's it. They wouldn't have put that much effort into listing every single possible branch there might be because if the brand continues to be popular they will more likely want to keep collaborating with Keta and you would find your information that way. Whereas by 2017 there are lots of brands that are distinctly and exclusively Lolita including Japanese brands, although by then um, Gothic and Alita Bible started showcasing non-Japanese brands like Korean ones and Chinese ones. There was more to show and those brands were being stocked in Japan, notably via Atelier Piro and their shops, but also as long as Kera Shop itself continued in Kera Shop. It made sense for them to include previews of other Lolita brands that were available to purchase in Japan, regardless of where the brands were from, because it's simply good business. If someone sees it in a magazine, it adds legitimacy to the brand and could potentially convince someone to purchase the item. Because of this, as well as other things that I'll touch on, the last issue is significantly bigger than the first. Issue 1 had 82 pages and they were focused on the fashion. By the final issue, which has 114 pages, just the preview pages themselves have expanded and grew to be more than this, as well as the magazine grew in other content. For example, in issue 1, whilst there is a page with street snaps, it's just one two-page spread all of the street snaps were taken from previous issues of the Keda magazine, which makes sense because if as a publisher you anticipated this to be a one-off, collecting separate dedicated street snaps just seemed like too much extra effort where you already had lots and lots of photographs that were appropriate to use. In issue 63, there are six whole pages 
full of street snaps taken specifically for this issue. Granted, by 2017, Kera and Gothic and Lolita Bible started scheduling street snaps in that there would be a call out to say that photographers will be in and around this area on this day and people would follow those updates, put a coordinate on specifically to be photographed for the magazine and hope that they'll get featured. Whereas people in the street snaps in 2001 were genuinely just out and about. Even if the magazine had wanted to schedule and direct some street snaps, it wouldn't have been easy considering that in 2001 not everyone had access to the internet in their mobile phone on them constantly 24-7. So it would have required more planning, more advance notice and considering that there are cool people on the streets of Harajuku that if asked will be happy for you to take their photo and feature it in a magazine, why would you? And in 2017, most of the people in Harajuku are tourists looking for those cool people who by now have been driven somewhere else. So organizing a call out to say, this is happening, this is the day, this is the area, this is roughly the time, guarantees the photographers and the magazine editors that there will be someone to photograph and something new to feature. On top of this, over the years, Gothic and Lolita Bible grew in additional content, as well as expanded to have each issue follow a broad theme. The first one is just there to introduce Gothic and Alita fashion. The content that is contained in here is either aimed at people who are already in that fashion, like an interview with Mana, or aimed at people who are new to it and interested in it, like a lexicon or a comic illustrated by Mihara Mitsukazu that follows someone around the shops in Harajuku that sell Gothic and Lolita clothing, which in itself is a really clever way of doing a guide that's both useful and interesting and entertaining. The final issue, as you may be able to gather by the cover, was themed around fairies and includes more non-releases and non-makeup related content. So we have two more editorial themed photo shoots. We have one artist spread. We still have a comic, although this time it's more separate story that fits the issue as opposed to something that also happens to be useful. There's a story, a short story written exclusively for the magazine. There is one article about a cafe, including a brief interview with people running that cafe. There is one extensive article discussing fairies in Western history and culture, like in works of literature. There is one two-page spread about broader culture news, so brief reviews of books or films that might be of interest to Lolitas. And there are two event reports full of pictures as well as a brief overview of what had happened. Whilst both issues include patterns with instructions on how to follow them and how to make the things, by 2017 Gothic and Alita Bible also started to include other extras, notably posters. But all of this points to the idea that although we tend to think of the old school Lolitas as the true lifestylers, they were the people who wore those clothes as clothes every day out and about whether they're just getting eggs from the supermarket or going to a cafe to meet a friend. They were wearing Lolita, whereas now, or at least in 2017, we tend to think of Lolita fashion as something that's done on a weekend and lifestylers are less common slash less visible in that they may be wearing other fashions as well as Alita. Yet the content included in issue 63 feels very much aimed, if not at lifestylers, then at people aspiring to encompass Lolita more broadly in their lives. Whether that is through finding out interesting places or things to do, watch, read, or getting additional information or learning about things that otherwise you might not have picked up, like in this case, fairies in Western culture. 
The magazine is there to provide entertainment as well as information about releases, even though by 2017, by the time the issue had come out, we'd already seen majority of the releases previewed somewhere else anyway. On the slightly more negative side as to why the final issue was considerably thicker than the first one is that it includes more ads. And whilst, of course, it's not that issue one is completely free of advertisements, the advertisements in issue one are, again, specific to the interest of people into Gothic and Alita fashion, which means predominantly ads from brands that haven't been featured. Angelic Pretty is a good example. There is an advertisement for Angelic Pretty in issue one of Gothic and Alita Bible, even though there isn't a spread of what are the Angelic Pretty releases. I think the other one that's featured in here as an ad rather than release preview is Atelier Boz. By 2017 and issue 63, not only whatever brand wanted to be featured was probably already featured in the form of a release preview, there weren't that many other ones that didn't get in who could afford to pay for an advertisement being featured. And as such, there's an interesting range of advertisements that we see here. Some of them, you can kind of understand how they might be relevant to Lolitas. For example, ads for coloured contact lenses or for certain shops. But there are also two, at least one page advertisements in here for courses. One of which being, you know, a selection of music courses. So I guess it's almost aiming that for wannabe idols. And then there is a casino course, which there's no nicer way to say it. I fail to see how that is remotely relevant to the interest of a potential Lolita. And a general assortment of miscellaneous ads, you know, other shops, apps, things like this. But the fact that issue 63 includes those suggests to me that the focus really has shifted away from individuals, artists and the fashion to businesses and profit. Because whilst I'm sure there was a selection process involved in deciding which advertisement goes in and how much space they get, it still begs the question of why some of these have gotten in. And in the wise words of my mother, if you don't know what it's about, it's about money. So considering that Gothic and Alita Bible has gone out of print in no small part because they weren't selling enough copies of it and that printed magazines were starting to fall out of fashion and popularity, it feels understandable that they'd accept money from businesses that wanted to advertise themselves in their magazine even if they weren't quite quite so relevant to the interests of the intended audience. Still, this is, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively minor gripe to have with the final issue of Gothic and Alita Bible because majority of the content that is in there is somehow relevant to Lolitas and is relevant and of interest to Lolitas who are already in the fashion. As I said, this can almost give off a vibe of a guide to people who are new and interested in Gothic and Alita fashion. And whilst there's obviously things that are of interest to those who are already in the fashion, like the interview with Mana and the brand previews and street snaps and makeup tutorials, things like this, there's plenty of content that is aimed at newcomers and beginners, things that introduce things like that lexicon, like that comic, taking you around Harajuku and showing you where the shops are instead of you having to find it out on a map from the address printed down at the bottom of an editorial photo shoot picture. Whereas this is not guiding you by the hand and telling you what things are. This is assuming that you already know that. If you were a newbie to Lolita Fashion and picked this up, you'd probably still learn bits and bobs, but you might have to do a lot more consciously constructing 
of information and looking things up further. Be that to decipher all the terms like JSK, even though as a native Japanese speaker you might have come across that anyway. You'd still have things like, you know, the hair and makeup tutorials, you could look at how clothes are put together, but it's not taking you by the hand and guiding you through what things are. This assumes that you already know it and you picked this up because you're interested in that fashion already. Ooh, that was a workout. God, it's gone dark. Lord knows what this has done to the video. All in all, comparing the two side by side is almost like getting an experience of time travel and seeing the journey that Lolita Fashion has made between 2001 and 2017. Because as you've probably gathered from the comments I made and the things that I've pointed out, the main place where the differences between the issues stem from are rooted in how the fashion has changed over those years. The core components are still there in both issues you get your brand previews, you get some hair and makeup tutorials, you get some street snaps, you get some patterns, you get a little bit of other content that seems interesting and relevant to you as an intended audience of the Gothic and the Lita Bible. But between 2001 and 2017, as Lolita fashion expanded and grew, so has the magazine in the form of including more features from regular ones like event reports to themed ones to match the particular theme of the issue like conceptual photo shoots or articles giving you a little bit more of the knowledge type things as well as providing resources such as the shop list at the end to guide you to where there might be somewhere selling these things near you so you don't feel like a trip to Tokyo is your only way of getting your hands on these clothes. And on the other hand the changes stem from how the fashion has changed itself from this more rebellious rough around the edges look that we now know as old school which even though it had things in lighter colorways was overall more on the darker side, as the name would suggest, Gothic and Lolita Bible, to a look that is not only far more elaborate, but overall lighter and clearer on distinctions between substyles. In 2001, it was all Gothic and Lolita Bible, and whilst you could argue that this is definitely Gothic, this is definitely classic, this is definitely sweet, the feel of all those clothes was quite similar and the differences came down to either styling or quite minute details particularly as prints weren't much of a thing back then. By 2017 each substart of Lolita fashion, sweet, gothic and classic, have their own core look and whilst some of them overlap like sweet and classic or classic and gothic, they are distinct enough that the magazine editors have now boxed off the darker ones on a separate page, caged them goths in their own separate pages away from the sweet people and decided to prioritise the lighter aesthetic of sweet and classic styles which have been more popular at that time than gothic or certainly had more appeal to the public considering that for several years leading up to the final issue of Gothic and Lolita Bible, the overall look of them has been lighter, more colourful, more pastel, rather than dark Victorian, frumpy, grungy, rough around the edges and rebellious. The fashion has also gone from almost needing that influence from adjacent people and artists like Mihara Mitsukazu, like Mana, like other musicians in the scene at that time, to having its own people. Again, someone like Mihara Mitsukasa and illustrators and artists in general overlap those spheres. But we now have set Lolita models. Musicians, whilst do still dip in and out of, are not so much of key figures as they were back in 2001. By the time Gothic and Lolita Bible has ceased publication as a standalone printed magazine, the fashion was established as its own thing. And although the magazine continued to include some 
more adjacent looks. I don't want to say just gothic ones, as in gothic and Lolita Bible, because there were things that lean slightly more otome or maybe slightly more fairy cake, maybe natural cake, like things that were near enough to Lolita that they could be incorporated but not straying too far from it, as all of that was still relegated to Kera and kept in there. The fashion was its own thing, it has established itself as an entity worth following for its own merits and didn't need to be tagged along to other things. If anything, there were other things that were being tagged along to and with Lolita fashion to include in that magazine, almost reversing that from the first issue. However, throughout its time throughout the 16 years that the magazine has been in publication it offered good quality content that was of interest to people in Lolita fashion and relevant to Lolita fashion in some way or another reflecting what the fashion looked like at that time and what people were looking to get out of that magazine moving from guides and instructions to things that we'd probably consider more lifestyle related and on that note thank you so much for watching this video i hope that you have found it interesting i hope that petty cats the ones who have requested this video found it interesting i'm hesitant to offer to do more things like this because i don't have a big collection of gothic and lolita bible magazines i do have a small collection of lolita related magazines publications in general and things that are new and incoming i tend to review on my blog but if there are things that I like this, that it'd be interesting seeing. By all means, let me know and I'll see what can be arranged. Until then, if you've enjoyed this video, then make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment on it, subscribe to the channel. My aim is to make one video a month. These days, that video tends to be the Around Your Wardrobe in 30 Coordinates Challenge lookbook video, but there have been other ones being brought out. Sometimes there'll be two a month. Sometimes if I'm feeling like I want to get something out right here, right now, there'll be three a month. <laughs> one a month is your guarantee. Anything extra? is on top of that and whilst i'm aiming to have it sometime mid-month it's not a set date so if you want to make sure that you don't miss that then make sure to click the bell button next to the subscribe one so that you're notified when that happens as mentioned before if you want to be extra sure that you don't miss that next video upload and that you get it early my patreon link is in the description box below so i encourage you to join that and as always i encourage all of you to check out my blog which is cupcakes and unicorns where you'll find more lolita content thank you so much and i'll see you in the next one take care bye <laughs>